Thank you. Good morning, everyone. The meeting of the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs is now come to order. Will the secretary please call the roll? Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Black. Here. Assemblywoman Brown May. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Ellison. Present. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblyman Matthews. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Vice Chair Torres. Here. Chair Flores. Thank you. There is one, um, there are 13 members president and one um, that is, if we could just mic, mark Chair Flores um, president as he arrives. Um, we will, we do have a quorum, so we may begin the meeting. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. We will be here holding a hearing on exactly one bill today. As you know, the legislative building remains close to the public, and so all committee meetings will be held virtually. Committee members, staff, and everyone else will be participating either through Zoom or by telephone. For, co for committee members, I would just like to remind you to silence or turn off all electronics and phones during the meeting and mute your microphones while you are not speaking to minimize background noise. Please leave your cameras on so that we maintain a quorum throughout our meeting today. And please state your name for the record every time you unmute your mic to, sleep, to speak. Um, it does help our secretaries keep accurate records of the meeting minutes. Members of the public who wish to testify or present public comment will have the option to call in or submit written testimony or comments. I would encourage those wishing to offer testimony on a measure, do so in writing to ensure that we receive your full statement. In the interest of time, testimony and support, opposition and neutral will be limited to two minutes. Anyone can submit testimony in writing by using the submit open opinion option in Nellis that is located on the webpage to today's meeting. Um, or by email to asmga at asm.state.nv.us. To make the best use of limited time, please avoid repeating points that have already been made. Uh, you feel free to use ditto or I agree. Um, those are all sufficient options. And um, please avoid reading long testimony. Instead, summarize and focus on the key points of your testimony and provide your written testimony to committee staff within 48 hours of today's meeting. Um, I would like to now open the hearing on AB 99. Assemblyman Ellison, please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, uh, or members of the committee, for the record, I'm John Ellison, representing Assembly District 33. I am here today to represent, to present AB 99. If I screw up, please bear with me. Uh, here's the problem we're facing right now. As you know, prevailing wages paid on public fund projects are determined through the survey conducted by the Nevada Labor Commission. Rates are determined by region, which separates between rural and urban counties. The, third, the current threshold for prevailing wage on a project is 100,000 and applies to all counties, regardless of the size. And that's one of the problems we have. In some of our communities throughout rural Nevada, public agencies are struggling to get single public work projects completed on very small budgets, such as construction projects, maintenance, repairs, rebuilding, such which include parks or libraries or public buildings, sidewalks replacement, asphalt replacement, or maintaining on things that cost 100000 or less is almost impossible. To consider the actual start of the construction project, these counties or cities must save for long periods of time for large projects, making the people of these communities wait uh, for which could be essential services. It's even harder to get larger companies to bid a project in some of these rural areas under $250,000. I'll give you an example, uh, Eureka County, one of the projects they were doing, the motels are full, there's only one, one one motel 
and uh, RV park and they're full with the mines and with the COVID, there's no restaurant. So you got to drive 90 miles each way every day if you're going to uh, work in that community. So if you consider some of the small communities that have a total public working budget of some of $200,000 and less, the city of Wales, I'll give you an example, the city of Wales is still rebuilding after the earthquake that devastated the town and an operating budget of $450,000 a year. Uh, that's on public works money. Uh, some cities and counties have been hit so hard during the COVID pandemic, but lower sales tax and rooms tax has put a burden on all communities in Nevada, no matter where you're at, if you're in Las Vegas, Elko, or Washoe. Every county in Nevada is different by nature, size, population, industry, gaming, mining, recreation, or agriculture. There's no two counties alike in Nevada. This is why I propose an amendment which would limit the provisions of this bill to apply only to rural counties with a population of 100,000 or less. With approval of, every, with approval of the amendment, uh, the project located in the counties with a population of 100,000 or less, if the cost construction project is less than $250,000 in prevailing wage provisions do not apply, please see uh, the copy of the conceptual amendment on Nellis. And I think that's important because we're not trying to change the state, we're just trying to help the rural communities. I believe this is a very responsible balanced proposal. This bill will allow for more necessary projects to be completed and more jobs to be created. More people will be put to work. It would essentially more citizens to put food on their table and care for their families, pay their mortgages and continue the everyday life without worries of losing everything. And I know there's a lot of people who feel very passionate about this, and you're going to hear a testimony in opposition to this bill. I want to go on the record saying this is not anti-union bill. My intent is to make sure that local government in rural parts of our state can provide essential services to the citizens with limited resources available to them. I feel we must work together to come up with a workable solution for all of our state and all of our citizens. And I think that's the most important thing I can say. If you could see some of these small communities that they're, they're trying to build out, but it, it's kind of hard when there's such limited resources. If you look at Jackpot, Windover, Wells, Carlin, Ely, Tonopah, Hawthorne, I can go on and on, but there's 15 of these counties that are affected by this. And, and if we can come up with a solution to make this work, we could, every one of us can build out of the problems that we see today. This includes my remarks, and I would like to have Daniel with Nevada Policy and PRI Research uh, to provide additional testimony. And thank you very much. And if you would want to, we can wait till the end for answers because we have uh, several people from around the counties that are going to testify. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Assemblyman Ellison, for your introduction. For the record, Daniel Honcheru. Uh, thank you as well to uh, Chairman Flores and Vice Chair, Vice Chair Torres for allowing me to present AB 99 on behalf of the Nevada Policy Research Institute. This is a relatively simple bill to understand, but to begin, I'd like to offer some background information regarding prevailing wage mandates in Nevada. Since 1937, Nevada law has required that workers constructing state-funded public, public works projects receive a special kind of minimum wage called the prevailing wage. Prevailing wage laws sound like they are intended to ensure that workers receive wages reflective of the local labor market. The Nevada Labor Commissioner, however, administers these laws in a way that ensures trade unions are able to control state mandated prevailing wage rates. As former Nevada Labor Commissioner Michael Tanchek wrote to former Governor Jim Gibbons, quote, state and local government agencies pay more for construction projects than the private sector pays for comparable projects, saying otherwise would be denying the obvious, unquote. This is not surprising because the survey methodology used to compute the prevailing wage is riddled by sampling errors, meaning that the representation of unions among the responses is far higher than among the actual population. 
for a number of reasons, non-union contractors incur far higher accounting costs to complete the survey than union contractors. At this point, I will share my screen. Please pardon. All of this, pardon me. <clears throat> All of this has resulted in hyperinflated taxpayer costs. NPRI's most recent analysis, which relies upon 2019 data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Nevada Labor Commissioner, found that prevailing wages are 60% above the market on a weighted average basis. Moreover, because the prevailing wage rate also includes the cost of benefits, we increased the, the average market wage by 50% to account for the cost of benefits in the private sector. This is an extremely conservative assumption, meaning that the actual disparity is likely even greater than what is reported here. In fact, when MPRI last performed a comprehensive analysis, totaling the increased taxpayer costs of such wage premiums across the state, we found that prevailing wage mandates cost taxpayers nearly $1 billion across fiscal years 20, uh, 2009 and 2010. With that background, I'll reaffirm Assemblyman Ellison's primary purpose for bringing forth this bill to ensure our tax dollars are spent more wisely and go further. As introduced, AB 99 proposes to increase the threshold at which prevailing wage mandates apply for NG construction projects from $100,000 to $250,000, an action which would partially undo the changes made under AB 136 of the 2019 session. Sections two and three of this bill illustrate the mandatory language for NRS chapter three, uh, 338 required, replacing $100,000 in statute with $250,000. Section one merely makes a conforming change. Section four of AB 99 as originally introduced asserts that its amendatory provisions will not apply to any construction projects that are awarded before July 1st of this year. As such, AB 99 will not invalidate any existing uh, contracts. Uh, section five merely prescribes that this bill would become effective on July 1st 2021 if passed and signed into law. Now let me address the amendments proposed by Assemblyman Ellison. The conceptual amendment put forth by Assemblyman Ellison similarly proposes to increase the threshold at which prevailing wage rates apply from $100,000 to $250,000 for rural county projects. For the same reason stated by Assemblyman Ellison, we support this amendment. Quite frankly, NPRI supports the complete abandonment of prevailing wage laws in Nevada, but marginal progress is progress nonetheless. Regarding potential taxpayer savings, it is difficult to provide detailed estimates here, largely because future projects have not yet been contemplated, but the taxpayer costs incurred by modestly increasing prevailing wage mandates as with AB 136 of 2019 are instructive. The fiscal notes submitted by NG regarding AB 136 indicated an $18 million hit over the current biennium, although that bill included two reforms specific to NG, so that estimate itself is certainly overstated. But by simply increasing the proportion of the prevailing wage that applies to school district construction from 90% of the prevailing wage to 100%, AB 136 increased school construction costs for Clark County by tens of millions, according to CCSD's own fiscal notes. I will stop sharing my screen now. To conclude, these are not small dollars at stake and prevailing wage laws result in our tax dollars being used in unwise and inefficient ways. Uh, ways that, for example, seem to impeach any claim that Nevada schools are underfunded. I urge this committee to follow the trend of states which have recently abandoned 
their prevailing wage laws and adopt these in comparison, very modest reforms. Again, I thank this committee uh, for allowing me to present uh, today. We strongly support Assembly Bill 99 at the Nevada Policy Research Institute. And thank you for co-presenting. Briefly, I wanted to say thank you to uh, Madam Vice Chair for uh, taking care of the committee while I was presenting in a different committee. Uh, Assemblyman Allison, uh, is there anybody else that you wish to co-present with you? I know that you indicated there were several. We have several people. Uh, uh, I know that Delmo Androzzi is on the phone. Uh, he is a uh, county commissioner from Elko County. He's a previous assistant county uh, city manager of the city of Elko. So he's got some knowledge uh, of uh, the prevailing wage and, and the effects it has on some of the rural community. Elko is kind of uh, better than most. Uh, it, it, the funding that they have for public works is a, a lot better than some of the smaller communities, but it's still, it, it's not enough to get projects done. And, and, and Mr. Androzzi can uh, address that. And I don't know if he's on the phone or not. Mr. Androzzi, are you there? Before we go to Assemblyman Allison, just for the sake of clarity, uh, these are all individuals that are co-presenting with you and will be on the line available for questions, or are they individuals that will be supporting your bill and you wish for them to speak during the support portion of the bill presentation? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. And, and uh, I think Mr. Androzzi would be available for questions also because of his knowledge with uh, Public Works. Understood. So we'll go to the line so that we could have your co-presenter um, address the concerns and or material prepared for him. Broadcast, can we please check if, if we have him on the line? Uh, Mr. Androzzi says he's having trouble trying to unmute. Yeah. And broadcast, if we could please request that you assist Mr. Androzzi uh, unmuting. Hi, um, Chair Flores, this is Cindy with Broadcast. I apologize, oh, excuse me, apologies. We're just trying to fix some technical issues on our end. One moment, please. No worries. We'll go into a one minute recess while Broadcast can And for the, uh, Mr. Chair, yeah. I appreciate you uh, for allowing me to present the bill today. Also, uh, I knew that you were busy and you, you had a bill to present. And I hope it went well. I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Just because we are in one minute recess, uh, uh, I know that none of this is going to the record. So I thank you for that, uh, Assemblyman. Uh, likewise, Chairman Flores from Daniel Hontru, I appreciate the opportunity to present today. And we thank you all for, for being available uh, to, to join us this morning. And I know Madam Vice Chair uh, sent, sent some intimidating fists um, via video to you all. Never intimidating, never intimidating. <laughs> Mr. Chair, we, we still have several people that's going to testify, like League of Cities and, and NACO, if you wanted to take them or you wanted to go into questions and answers or however you want to do it. Well, we could open up the hearing again and, and we could go into questions and answers now. And then all those wishing to testify um, could then do it in the support uh, column of, of the bill presentation. And that may work if that if that's to your pleasure um if you feel confident that both yourself and your co-presenter could could address the bulk of the questions and we would gladly do that and we could um, call the meeting back to order are you comfortable with that yes sir all right thank you
The Assembly Committee of Government Affairs will come back to order. Thank you, uh, Assemblyman Ellison, for your presentation this morning. And again, uh, on the record, thank you to Madam Vice Chair for uh, taking care of the committee. Uh, at this time, we're gonna go ahead and open it up for questions. I, I recognize that there is a host of individuals wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 99. Uh, know that you will have an opportunity to speak during uh, support uh, to put your uh, comments on the record. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and open it up to Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Assemblymember Ellison, as well as Mr. Anshu for bringing this forward and for clarifying that it's not anti-union. Um, I do have a few questions, but I'll just stick to two at this time. The first one, I just need a little bit of clarification as to what exactly these projects apply to. Because uh, Assemblymember Ellison, you brought up restaurants and hotels, and yet I, I, reading it, I thought it was for public works. So could you clarify that, please, for exactly which projects these, this would be dealing with? Yes, that was that was to describe how uh, one of the projects they did in Eureka. Uh, it's such a, a rural area. When they went to do a project up there, the motels were full and the restaurants were closed. So they had to drive 90 miles one way or 90 miles the other way in the morning or at night just to get to the project. Uh, everything that we're talking about here is public work project. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Eureka County just did a great job on the courthouse and that was a union project. It, it, the job went great. They had motels, they had the restaurants open. They, they did a wonderful job. And that's what we want. But we're talking about the little bitty projects like right now in, in the city of Elko could you know testify to that when they get on there. To do sidewalks, right now they could probably do uh, three quarters of a project on sidewalks, curb, gutter, and sidewalks, what they could if, if the prevailing wage wasn't there. And, and that's some of the issues that they're having. Uh, they need to get these projects done, but they're limited with the amount of money they do. Uh, they just replaced all the air conditionings on the, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, school there in Elko in the gymnasium. And that was all prevailing wage because the project was I don't know, three quarters of a million dollars. So we're talking about the little projects that are really hurting, not the big ones. And we support the big ones. Um, so I hope that answered your question. It did, it, it clarified it. Thank you. Um, I do have another question, Mr. Chair, if I may. Please follow up. Thank you. So. Uh, thank you for that clarification. I, I, I was getting a little bit confused. Like I thought this was for public work. So that, that greatly uh, appreciated that one. My other question though, has to do with the way that some of the um, items are brought forward because I have been intimate with some of the different construction sites on um, school projects in particular, where sometimes you'll start off with one element and then you go to the next element and then you go to the next element. And these are all three different contracts, but it's for the same building. With this, let's just say that you've got one portion of that contract is for 190, 190,000. The next one is for 180,000. And the next one is for 150,000. Is it all three steps together combined or is it each step separately that could possibly be approved by the county commission that you're speaking of? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the, the question. One of the things they've got is they can't bundle projects. So say they they have, uh, uh, like the senior citizen building right now is either going to have to be repaired or rebuilt. So if they went in and tried to repair it to extend the life in Wells, Nevada, uh, that project, if it goes to uh, rebuild, they could probably repair the, the building for for. 150, 200,000. But if it goes to a new building, it'd have to go out to one, well, they'd both be one project, but it, it'd, it'd be so big that it, it opens up to everything. So uh, I hope that that explains it, but it, trying to say that they can't bundle projects. They can't say, oh, I'm gonna do this, this, and this on, on 100,000, they can't do that. It's gotta be the same project. So if they have to put a roof on, on a building and that's $180,000, they'd have to use prevailing wage right now under this law. But if, if it wasn't, they could probably get that roof done uh, for less than 100,000 or right at 100,000 and that'd be one project. 
Thank you for that clarification. And I'm glad you, you and I'm glad you know some about bundling and, and projects. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for that clarification. I do have other questions, but I know that there are others that do as well. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for that. And I might have other questions after others ask theirs. Perfect. Thank you, Assemblywoman, for your questions. If we could go next to Assemblywoman Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate um, this time to uh, speak about this. And thank you, um, Assemblyman um, Ellison. I am a novice and um, I am really concerned um, when I hear about, you know, prevailing wage and um, and with my understanding after reading this and after hearing um, uh, the gentleman from NPRI um, and we're talking about prevailing wage and we're talking about um, the requirements to um, increase the threshold to 250,000 and I'm trying to figure out how does this how does prevailing uh, raising the prevailing wage stimulates our economy and when i read about it um, and i go to the federal rate i'm seeing two thousand dollars and that we have a lot of states in the union that um, are uh, following the federal rate so why are we in nevada when we are at a a uh, I mean, a pandemic as far as our economy is concerned, why are we now introducing raising when we should be stimulating our economy and why not lower uh, to um, um, coincide with the federal rate of $2,000? Um, that's my first question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Ed, I might be able to get NPRI to, to answer that, but I can tell you an example. Uh, if, say, a project is $150,000 right now, it has to be prevailing wage. And say they only have $100,000 or less than $100,000 to do this project because of the funding. There's they're real tiny community. So say they, they only have eighty dollars to $100,000 period to do this project if it was the prevailing wage went come in it had taken over there were therefore the project could not be done and the people could not work uh, that's the issue it's not because we don't support prevailing wage it's because they have to be within a zone or amount that the communities can afford to do it so uh you can either do the project or wait and extend it out. By then, you've got other problems in these small communities. So what we're trying to do is say at $250,000, we can maintain uh, a lot of these projects and keep a good wage out there, but not be in the prevailing wage rate. Uh, that's the problem. And, and uh, um, Daniel, have you got a comment on that? Uh, yes, um, through Chair Flores, uh, back to Assemblyman Ellison, um, addressing the Assemblywoman's uh, concerns regarding uh, federal prevailing wages. Uh, these, of course, involve uh, exclusively state-funded projects, and prevailing wages are intended um, to, or ostensibly intended, to represent local labor markets. And of course, we know that labor markets vary dramatically across uh, across the country. And so applying the same standard to New York City as we would in Elko um, would would seem to be a severe misstep. And 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 that's my my best response to that question. And Mr. Chair, follow up, please. Uh, please follow up. Thank you, sir. Um, you know, when I when I see um, on the chart that um, union workers are making $61 an hour, um, uh, reference the prevailing wage or sometimes $75 per hour, um, in our community, 
to me, that addresses our economy because they are living in our economy in the state of Nevada. They are contributing to our restaurants, our schools, our um, social activities. So they are putting that money that they make back into the economy, which right now we really, really need. So my question again is, how does raising the prevailing stimulate our economy? Uh, Mr. Ellison, uh, I, I will take this one if you'd like. Daniel Hontru again for the record. Um, in 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 brief terms, I think I think um, this is the worst time to to uh, to the worst time to to be inefficient with spending money during pandemic cry during the pandemic we've seen. Um, you know, people across the state suffering to degrees never seen before in this state. Um, it's it's best, I think, that we keep more money in the pockets of the people already suffering. Prevailing waging prevailing wages function to benefit a very specific certain group, um, typically uh, union labor, um, while kind of sacrificing. Um, the remaining population who who is who is then tasked with kind of making up the rest um, <clears throat> of, of the revenue discrepancy. And so I think, again, if you're talking about ways to improve our economy going forward, I think our best approach is, you know, lower taxes, lower spending, keep more money in the pockets of people um, and allow um, the state to reopen as soon as possible. Uh, thereby driving up revenues to the state, et cetera. Again, I think increasing taxpayer costs for everybody else but a select few will benefit the select few at the expense of the remaining populace. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Follow up, please. Thank you, sir. Again, um, and this is from a, a Economy um, Economic 101 when we put money into the economy that helps our state that helps our schools that helps just about everyone um, consu uh, con uh, consumer in this state it helps um, our food banks it helps just about everyone that um, that lives in the state of nevada again i cannot understand why a person making X amount of dollars over $31 versus $61, the person making $61 is able to spend more in the economy. I mean, they have um, what we like to say um, in Nevada, expendable money so that it helps our economy. So to tell me that raising the um, prevailing wage stimulates the economy. Uh, I really don't see that two plus two adding four right now. Um, so um, thank you for um, the privilege of allowing me to uh, express that comment, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, uh, may I uh, answer one question or an answer for uh, Ms. Thomas. If, if these you. projects, if these projects, I agree with you, we need to stimulate the economy, but here's the problem we have. If you've got a, if you've got a county that's only got a hundred thousand in the, if under the, if it goes to bid at a hundred thousand, you could do the project. But if it goes over a hundred thousand, uh, then what you have to do is, is if you can't come up with the money, then that job goes away. And then people don't work. Uh, and that's a problem we're having in these small counties. We're trying to get people to work and we're trying to do this in, in a very fast uh, way. But if it goes over that, that, that in the prevailing wage, then that project goes away and then people don't work. And, and that's what we're saying. We're trying to get these people to work and anything over 250,000 has got to be prevailing wage anyway. And it could be uh, bonded or whatever it's got to be. That's not the issue. The issue is, is these small jobs in these small communities. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. 
Mr. Mr. Elston, may I may I also say way on your comment here? Uh, again, Daniel Andrew for the record. Um, uh, Assemblyman Thomas, you you uh, referenced economics um, in your in your uh, economics 101 in your response to me. I'll I'll simply point out that macroeconomics um, also, you know, uh, seems to uh, you know operates on supply and demand principles as well. And so the price of labor should reflect the value of that labor. And what I hope this chart um, that I that I presented during my original presentation portrays is that we are way overpaying, tremendously overpaying for the value of labor uh, versus what we get in return. And in response, hurting the broader taxpayer base. So I, 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 it seems we we disagree on this issue, but I, but I uh, fully assert that. Uh, macroeconomic principles um, in this area rely on supply and demand principles, just like everywhere else in consumer society. And Mr. Chair, just wanted to readdress. Please. Thank you, sir. Um, basic economics for me uh, with this, as I stated before, um, uh, detailed to me that um, if we lowered the prevailing wage, then um, Assemblyman Ellison and the communities in the rural, it sounds like to me that um, they could um, assess um, what he wants to in the rules. Um, what I'm also saying is that those same workers that work in the rules, they're able to stimulate the economy by um, making the money that they do make. And we must say that um, just in um, the South, in Las Vegas particular, that we have buildings and just almost uh, cities in um, the uh, gaming industries that go up that, uh, that um, these unions, um, the work is exceptional. The work is so great that other cities in our nation um, hire our union workers. So um, again, I understand micro, I understand, you know, basic. Uh, economics, and I see your point, and I respect your point, but I am still belief that um, raising the prevailing wage will not stimulate our economy, and that's what we need to do right now. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Considine. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Assemblyman Ellis, for bringing this. I just had um, a, a couple of questions. Um, it's my understanding that beyond the, the thresholds um, that we've been talking about, part of prevailing wage is um, that it encourages the work to be done um, locally so that it's not folks that are you know, coming from out of state or that the pay is kind of leaving the state. Um, because people are just coming in to do small jobs and, you know, and then they're leaving and they're taking all of that funding out of the state. Um, and also, you know, that there is accountability because if it's locally uh, built uh, and it's done by your neighbors and people that you know, that there is more accountability for the buildings and the things that they're doing uh, because it's not only a matter of pride, but also they live in it um, and they, uh, they are still there if something goes wrong. So um, I didn't see anything about potentially um, adding protections or anything on your amendment to make that happen. So I guess that's kind of my first question. And then um, my second is uh, understanding how expensive things are. I mean, you mentioned that just adding air conditioning units to a building was over 250,000. How many um, jobs or how many contracts are you talking about between that 100,000 and 250,000 threshold? Thank you so much for the question. Uh, I give an example. Uh, say you have a project right now in 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 Eureka or Battle Mountain or Wells in these areas, and and you put a project out to bid, 
and uh, say you're going to add uh, commercial air conditionings on on whatever buildings or whatever you got to do, at, uh, uh, whatever the problem is. Uh, you lost power, all the water system it, going to the bathrooms in a park. And let's say it comes over $200,000 or $100,000. Uh, you put that out to bid, the odds of getting a union um, a contractor to go down there in these rural areas is almost impossible 90% of the time or 95% of the time because uh, they're so busy where they're at and there's not a lot of union labors out in these areas at all. So what they got to do is they have to bid it and if it goes over that rate, the, them people still have to charge prevailing wage uh, no matter what. But if they don't have the money and it's over their budget, then it has to drop down. And 90% of the people that come in, uh, they're not outside state contractors. They're, they're licensed contractors in the state of Nevada. And uh, I don't know, they've probably got seven or eight plumbing contractors in Elko. They probably got 10 electrical contractors in Elko. And, and they can make to these areas, but a lot of people don't come in for that smaller project. They just don't. Um, because of the time, by the time they travel, they bring all their equipment in. And if we can get the projects done under that, that rate, we can get the project done quick, fast, and, and stay within budget. Right now, the problem is, is the cost of material and labor has gone up so high and they've got such limited amount of funds. If it goes over that 100,000 right now, the, that project don't get done for a while. That's a problem we're running into. Thank you. Um, if I may just ask a follow-up, Chair. Follow-up. Um, um, I guess I'm now I'm just a little bit confused because I, I hear that you're saying that you can't get people to come in to do it, but at the, the same, I, I guess I'm sort of confused about what you're saying is that um, nobody, it's hard for you to get people to come in to do it because of the pay or um, that the, 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 um, the jobs are too small to get most people to come in. I'm, I'm not clear if you can expand yeah. on that. And also if you can tell me how many projects there are that would be between that 100,000 and 250,000 threshold. Well, I was hoping we can get the labor commission in today to testify on that. Uh, to give you an example, it's not that they're not uh, qualified people. They are highly qualified. But the problem is, is tr most of these projects over 100,000 are, are union labors and you can't get them there. So what we're trying to say, we're trying to get the jobs done at a lower budget, but uh, to try to get a union labor to come out of Reno or Salt Lake or Las Vegas to do a 200,000 or $100,000 job is almost impossible. Uh, they're so busy in the city, they don't come out. So we're trying to separate the difference between contractors and union labor contractors and the labor rates are, are or quite a bit of difference. And while we're saying if we can do that in a budget and still get the job done, we can. But trying to get a union uh, uh, contractor, when they did the schools in Wendover, they got no bids from Nevada uh, uh, contractors, none. And that was a, over a million dollar project. So I hope that I hope that answered your question. What we're trying to say, there's two different types of labor base, a local labor base that can go in and do the job uh, and say they're, char they're, they're charging $50, $60 an hour for, for their, their plumbers or whatever. But if it goes to prevailing wage and that goes way up and that's a problem we're trying to get resolved to get these people to work. Thank you, Assemblyman Ellis, and I, I apologize for cutting you off. I just see in the chat here that uh, Ms. Chambers, the Labor Commissioner, is here with us today, and she would like to oh, chime good. In. So go ahead and chime in, Ms. Chambers. So good morning, members of the committee, Madam Vice Chair Torres, Chairman Flores. This is Shannon Chambers, for the record, Nevada Labor Commissioner. So I can speak to the issue of how many projects that we've issued public works project numbers are during the past two fiscal years. We do not have visibility of product of I'm sorry of projects under a hundred thousand because they do not require our public works project number. So I can tell you for reference that in fiscal year um, 2019 2020 there were 848 public works projects which we issued public works project numbers on. 
Going into 2021, we are already at 628. So by the time we get through fiscal year 2021, my estimate is we will be over a thousand. Now these are all projects over a hundred thousand dollars because that is the public works project amount. We don't have visibility of those smaller projects because again, we don't issue the public works project number. What I will also tell you that in terms of, and I have great respect for Assemblyman Ellison, there is still the exemption in the law for normal maintenance. So Nevada Revised Statute Section 338.011 still has an exception for normal maintenance. So an awarding body and a public body can use that exception. They can also use an exception for emergencies. So there are exemptions to even the $100,000 amount. Again, those have to be justified by the awarding body. But I can tell you from the labor commissioner perspective, I mean, obviously taking the public works project dollar amount back to 100,000 has certainly increased projects, but we have not seen a delay in projects in the rural areas or in the what they call the urban areas there seems to be if anything an expansion of public works projects and what i you know what i want to say is no matter what this legislative body does the labor commissioner always adjusts we adjust to 250 we adjust to 100 but i just wanted to give you a clear perspective on kind of you know where the law stands and and the numbers um if anything projects the amount of projects and as the economy gets better we expect them to increase so i'm happy to answer any questions thank you uh ms chambers uh, uh, madam chair may i ask a question And just to be clear, Assemblyman, do you have a question for Ms. Considine or for, for Assemblyman Considine or for Ms. Chambers? Ms. Chambers, yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chambers. And I really appreciate you giving us these numbers. Could you tell me the breakdown between uh, these projects between rural or urban areas? Is these all rural area projects or are these strictly the state projects? So again, for the record, Shannon Chambers, Nevada Labor Commissioner, Madam Vice Chair, through you and uh, Mr. Chair, through you to Assemblywoman Ellison. So the majority of the pro projects are in the urban areas, but I will tell you, Assemblyman Ellison, in Elko County, Eureka County, we have seen a big increase in projects. So to your point, the number of projects is going up in those areas. I mean, I can get you the exact breakdown for those specific counties. But again, the majority of projects are still in Washoe and Clark. Yeah. And yeah, and I appreciate that. And, and Elko in Eureka is probably the best in the city, is probably the best that could handle some of the project. It's some of the ones like Wells, uh, uh, Carlin, Ely, Tonopah, the small, small communities that we're really concerned about getting these projects out. And I've never seen them ever use uh, uh, to go back in and ask for an exemption. And I've been in this for 30 years and, and I didn't even know that it exists and if they could apply for it. Uh, and if they did, what would be the process they went through? But I know that some of the projects that we're trying to do now, like in, in Wells and maybe Jackpot, that, that uh, they still can't get the projects done under the prevailing wage rate. It, I just don't think they can. Um, we're trying, but the, the projects that are funded like Ely, when they just did the new courthouse, if it wasn't for my colleague from District 1, uh, helping, we'd have never got that courthouse built because we got it through the state funding uh, at the legislature and and they they matched half and then the state stepped in, matched the other half. But, but if that wouldn't have happened, uh, that project would have never got done and they would end up condemning that courthouse eventually. Thank you. Uh, Assemblyman Ellison. My understanding is we were with Assemblywoman Considine, but that there is no longer a follow up there. And we next we have Assemblywoman Martinez. Is that correct, Madam Vice Chair? Thank you. If we could please go next to Assemblywoman Martinez. Thank you, Chair Flores. Thank you, Assemblyman. Um, so I have a few questions for you. So what impact will raising the threshold have on any entry projects in the future? Uh, could you restate that? I'm sorry. 
my question was, what impact will raising the threshold have on any NC products and projects in the future? Well, it, what did it do is it, it helped these small projects get through. Um, like I said, it you know you're, you're set by limited funds, and what this would do is let these projects go forward and get get completed. Uh, but if if they got to comply to the prevailing wage rate, some of these will have to dis be extended out. That's the only thing they can do. They don't have the funding and. And when when the testimony comes into some of these counties that, that, that tell you what they're facing right now, uh, yeah, yeah, you probably understand a little more. But uh, it's not that they're trying to not uh, skirt. What they're trying to do is get the projects done. And if, if the people get out and look to some of these rural counties, you, you'd understand what I, I meant by what they're receiving and 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 they they save for public fund budgets and is just short. They got to live within their budget. Follow up, Chair. Please follow up. Um, is there any indication that ENSHE will stop doing projects if the threshold is raised? Um, uh, I, Mr. Chair, I think uh, the Labor Commission wanted to weigh in on that, I think. Understood. If we can go to our, our commissioner, please. So good morning, this is Shannon Chambers again for the record, Nevada Labor Commissioner, uh, Mr. Chair, through you um, to Assemblywoman Martinez. I can't speak for NSHE. Um, I have not had that conversation with them. I will tell you again, back to my original kind of answer to your question, Assemblywoman Considine, the Labor Commissioner will adjust no matter what. In my opinion, as of today, the amounts don't stop the projects. What stops the projects is potentially the economic situation and sometimes weather, sometimes things like COVID-19, but it's my view and I have not had personally had that conversation with NC, so I cannot say that, but there are other factors in play that actually stop the projects. That's right. Thank you. And I just have another another question. So I keep hearing throughout the conversation, I keep hearing union keeps coming up. But my understanding is that any contractor, union or non-union, can bid on these contracts. Is that correct? That's correct. But it, it's like if you go buy a car and you want a, a, a new Cadillac and you've got $20,000, you're going to end up with a smaller car. And that's that's the problem we have. We're trying to get these small projects done and, and any more, $100,000, nothing on a construction project. Um, so what they're trying to do is just try to stay within their budget and get the projects done. That's what they're trying to do. Nothing more, nothing less. And and then, uh, I mean, if, they, if you don't get a union contractor down there, which most likely they won't on a small project, they still have to pay prevailing wage rates to them individuals, no matter what they do. What we're trying to do is if we can raise that threshold up to the 250, uh, we can get that project done with a little less money, save the money and get the people to work. That's what we're trying to do. Thank you. And just one more, I just, I wanted to clarify. So prevailing wage law is for the benefit of all Nevadans, not just union. Is that correct? Yeah, it, anybody can benefit from it. But if, if the project runs up over, uh, and then I think you'll get the school board that'll testify on on the difference between the projects, and and uh, you'll see some of their testimony that's in there that's already on uh, on Ellis. Uh, how how some of these projects could be so high that it it extends it out, and you're talking a lot of this stuff at two hundred fifty thousand is nothing. So we're trying to say maintenance. If this was a, a, a half a million dollar or a million dollar project. Uh, we want prevailing wage on them projects. Uh, we, we definitely do, but we're talking the small thing. Uh, and that's the difference. And that's what this is about. It, it's not the larger projects at all. And they can still collect prevailing wage, but that doesn't mean the project will go through. Thank you, Mr. Ellison, Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Next, we have Assemblyman Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Assemblyman Ellison for your presentation and uh, good to see you, Mr. Huntru. Um, a few questions for Mr. Huntru. Um, you spoke a little bit about the disparity between prevailing wages and market rates. Uh, I'm wondering if you could discuss the trend. Has that disparity 
Uh, is that something that's increased in recent years? Has it remained flat? What's the trend we're seeing in that disparity? Daniel Hontru, for the record, through the chair to Assemblyman Matthews. Uh, great question. Um, NPRI performed the same analysis back in 2011 as we submitted uh, for today's committee hearing. What we uh, found back then what was that prevailing wages were only about 45% higher than market rates. Whereas today, again, that number is more like 60%. So in terms of a widening disparity in recent years between market rates and prevailing, weight and prevailing wages, um, that disparity has certainly increased and is likely to in the future as well. Uh, thank you. And um, I wanted to ask specific to a recent um, large project here in the state, do you have an estimate of what uh, prevailing wage mandates, uh, the extent to which those may have increased costs for uh, Las Vegas Stadium construction? For the record, Daniel Honshru through Chair Flores to the Assemblyman Matthews. Um, I have not personally conducted any analysis of that sort, but if I recall correctly, uh, taxpayers borrowed about $750 million worth. Um, applying prevailing wages would certainly increase uh, the cost of stadium construction by tens of millions, if not by nine figures. Again, you know, the, the disparity between what is the market rate and what is the premium rate is so large that um, big dollar items um, and the labor costs associated with them, you know, it, it makes big dollar items even more expensive. Um, and so certainly I understand Assemblyman Ellison's approach here regarding only the smaller ones, but our point of view generally is that prevailing wage rates um, of all kinds um, are, are overly expensive and, and are a detriment to taxpayers. Thank you. A couple of follow-ups, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman. Please, Assemblyman. All right, thank you. Um, thanks for that answer, uh, Mr. Hontru. Um, We've heard some some discussion this morning, some questioning along the lines of economic stimulus. Um, I guess based on the presumption that um, these higher rates would result in more money in the pockets of of these workers who would then you know, be spending that money to stimulate the private economy. Just as a point of clarification, could you just let the committee know um, where it is that, that those funds uh, originate? You know, where, do they, where do they come from originally to get into this, this uh, private economy stimulus? Uh, for the record, Daniel Honshrew through the chair to Assemblyman Matthews. I'm, I'm not sure I fully I I fully understand um, the 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 question. Can you can you rephrase maybe? Sure. Uh, so the assumption being that you know more money in the pockets of these union workers is money that will end up in the private economy. Where does the oh, money so, come from originally oh, to get okay. there? Yeah, certainly. Well, uh, through. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Tirsilman Matthews, well, the money comes from taxpayers, and and that and that's our that's our prime uh, critique. Um, these are taxpayer-funded projects, and I think um, any government project should do its best to make sure that it doesn't overspend, that it spends reasonably on public works projects. Um, and again, as um, a former Nevada Labor Commissioner has suggested. These laws are intended to to make labor prices higher, and as I mentioned before, um, the result of that is that you have a small class of society that reaps all these benefits of dramatically increased wages, um, legally mandated, um, which acts um, to the detriment of the remaining taxpaying populace. Um, and so, you know, that's 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 the argument. So in other words, this isn't so much new money in, being injected into the private economy that would not otherwise be there. We're simply shifting resources from one segment of the private economy through the public sector and into another segment, more or less. Uh, through the chair to Assemblyman Matthews, Daniel Andrew, for the record, yes, uh, I, I, uh, I would uh, suggest you perceive our point of view uh, through a 
Milton Friedman lens and not a Paul Krugman lens. We agree with your uh, description of the dynamics there. Yes. And, and then one final question, uh, if I may. You're obviously someone who, who studies these issues in depth. Are you aware of any statistical evidence or data suggesting that more uh, robust prevailing wage mandates lead to actual increases in construction quality? Um, I, I, I know, pardon me, uh, Daniel Honshu for the record, through Chair Flores to Assemblyman Matthews. Um, I am aware of certain studies on the topic. Some seem to suggest that prevailing wage rates um, don't uh, dramatically alter um, the, the size and amount of contracts awarded generally. Um, we, we reject those kind of analysis. Um, but if, if that's the case, then why have prevailing wage laws at all? Um, so just, does, that, does that answer your question, Mr. Assemblyman? It does. It does. Thank you so much. And uh, and that's all for me this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Assemblyman. Next, I'd like to go to Assemblywoman Dickman. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Appreciate this opportunity. I actually have a couple of questions for Mr. Harshru and then one for the Assemblyman, if it's okay. Um, so, Mr. Harshru, I wanted to thank you, first of all, for your explanation of how prevailing wages are calculated. Because I think it's really interesting because uh, it doesn't seem to have much of a connection to the market or free markets. But anyway, my first question is, can you give us a little history um, of how prevailing wages came to be? Daniel Honshu, for the record, through the chair, uh, responding to Assemblywoman Dickman. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, prevailing wage laws in the states were originally modeled after the uh, federal uh, Davis-Bacon Act of 1931. Um, Nevada's came only six years later in 1937. Um, what the Davis-Bacon the Davis Act did uh, was effectively require union wages on federally funded projects. But, but there's more to the story here because back then, um, the, the act's intent was explicitly racist, uh, essentially preventing unions with black members from being awarded contracts. And so I think um, ultimately at, at a root level, uh, prevailing wage policies are grounded in discrimination. Interesting. And could I have a follow up with Mr. Honshu, please? Yes, Assemblywoman, please. Thank you so much. So you mentioned um, that other states have repealed these laws in recent years, I think. Could you give us a couple examples? Daniel Honju, for the record, through Chair Flores to Assemblywoman Dick, uh, Dickman. Uh, yes, uh, since 1978, at least 16 different states have altogether abolished their prevailing wage mandates. It's my understanding that about half of the states in the country have them and half don't. Uh, just since 2015, for example, we've seen the abolition of uh, prevailing wage mandates in the states of Michigan, Arkansas, Kentucky, Wisconsin, West Virginia, and Indiana. Um, so it, it has certainly been a trend and perhaps an accelerating one in recent years, um, again, for uh, fiscally conscious motivations going forward. Thank you so much. And then could I just have a quick question for the Assemblyman Ellison? Please, Assemblywoman. Thank you. So, Assemblyman, are you finding that there's a delay in providing essential services in rural communities because they don't have the budget to get these projects done in a timely manner? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to Ms. Dickman. Yes, I do. I strongly do. And, and, and the reason is, uh, I mean, you've only got so much money. And, uh, uh, you know, large projects is, is not an issue. You can bond, you can fund, you can do all kinds of things with larger projects. It's the smaller ones that are, are being hampered. And, and uh, you, you look around and wait till you talk to some of these people that are gonna give testimony. Uh, a lot of these projects, it, it's under 250,000. It used to be, we used to say, hey, we have to keep it under two, 250 to operate. 
right now with the COVID and, and the amount of people out of work uh, and trying to get people on this on project is almost impossible right now uh, because the funds are even less. And, and so it, it, I say some of these projects, if we don't get the, the prevailing wage rate, probably several years before they get done. Thank you so much, Assemblyman. And just for the Labor Commissioner, um, if we could get a breakdown of the projects that we talked about just in the rural communities, it would be really helpful um, if we could all, all the members get a copy of that. Thank you so much. And thanks for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman. If next we could go to Assemblywoman Black. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to say, you know, I was born and raised in, in Las Vegas for most all of my life. I've lived in a small community for the last five years, served on a city council in a small community. And there are certainly different uh, problems that small communities face. And we're not, that's just not even restricted to prevailing wage jobs. That's, that's contractors in general. So there's a, you know, you're worrying about um, not just the prevailing wa wage jobs, but the regular jobs as well is what I'm trying to say. And getting people to travel um, 90 miles from Las Vegas to do prevailing wage jobs in Mesquite is even a struggle. So I imagine for these other communities, it's even it's even more difficult. And at the end of the day, I think what the heart, the heart of the matter here is that the people of these communities are the ones that are suffering. And um, I, wholeheartedly would love to co-sponsor this bill if the assemblywoman would allow it. So I don't have any questions, but those are my comments. Thank you. And thank you, Assemblywoman. Next, I'd like to go to Assemblywoman Brown May. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I uh, my colleague asked the question that I had asked originally, so um, I withdraw my question. Thanks very much. And thank you, Assemblywoman. We always like a quick diddle here in this committee. Um, if I could please go to Assemblywoman Anderson. I think she had a follow-up question. Thank you. And it's based upon some of the answers uh, that, that we've been hearing. So uh, my I, I guess it has more to do right now with the, the phrase that was being kicked around for some time, which was supply and demand. Uh, when I look over some of the, the other data that we've received, as well as some of the information on some of the exhibits, um, I, and it's more of a comment, really. I don't know if it's a question or not. I am, uh, I've, I've got some hesitation because I feel that uh, many individuals in the construction industry currently it's very difficult to get jobs already, or it's very difficult to um, hire enough people as it is. And so lowering the amount of money that is necessary for a, for a project uh, doesn't quite fit the supply and demand item of how we are going to be um, helping to pay these individuals. So could you kind of expand upon that a little bit more? And I'm not sure exactly who that would be uh, directed to either individual that's been doing the presentation is more than welcome to answer the question about the supply and demand when it comes to the skilled workers that we're speaking about. Mr. Chair, uh, to you, to Ms. Anderson, she's right. But here's the, here's the thing of it is, is, is there's people out there want to go to work right now. They want to. But if a project stopped because of funding, there's nothing we can do about it. But if we can get that funding tightened up just enough to get these projects going, uh, they'll happen. Uh, I guarantee it, they'll happen. And, and you'll see these people go back to work. But you got people right now that is sitting at home and, and the, the small contractors are, are busy. They're, they're doing their jobs every day. Yeah. Uh, but if you can get these towns to get these projects done and get people to work, and these are small, small communities. We're not talking a big right. city. We're talking small communities. And that's where the problems are lying is, is in these real small townships. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, tone upon some of these, uh, you know, to get a project done right now, it's almost impossible and prevailing wage doesn't help. So what we're doing is just asking for a tool uh, in the toolbox. That's all we're asking for. Uh, 
And by lowering the prevailing wage rate and some of these, and we're not saying take it away, we're just saying lower, raise it up to 250,000 or whatever will work for them, everybody. But right now at 100,000, it's not working. That's not construction, that's maintenance. Thank you for that clarification and that acknowledgement of where I was coming from. Um, and then I do have another question. I believe this is for Mr. Anshu, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, sir. Um, I'm looking at an exhibit that was uploaded from Mr. Stanley, I believe, and it and he refers to a study that was done by Professor Waddux of UNLV and Professor Duncan of CSU Pueblo. Uh, you referred to some different studies. Can you expand possibly where those studies are from and um, if there's a way for us to get the, a copy of those studies so we can compare the two elements? Because I think it's important for us to come from a balanced point of view. Daniel Ancher, for the record, through Chair Flores to Assemblywoman um, Anderson. Um, I, I don't have any of that information to offer you right now, um, but I would certainly uh, be willing to uh, spend some time after this committee hearing and forward you everything uh, that, we, uh, that we can find. I think that'd be wonderful if we could get those documents and especially if they're coming from um, universities, colleges, other areas that are able to consider the studies across both our state as well as across our nation. Thank you so much. And it could go to all of the members of the committee. That'd be great. Thank you. And thank you, Assemblywoman. Um, just as a point of clarification to Assemblywoman Black, um, you expressed your desire to be amended uh, as a co-sponsor. Unbeknownst to you, you uh, were so excited about it that you signed on to it and, and forgot you're already a co-sponsor. So no need to amend the bill. You're, you're already listed on there proudly um, with a big fist up. So um, next, if we could please go to uh, Assemblywoman Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just um, have a point of clarification. Um, uh, during the conversation with Assemblyman uh, Matthews and Mr. Honcher, um, there, I, I, I'm, I'm not I'm sure, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. Did I hear that prevailing wage, a living wage, is racist in nature? That Davis-Bacon Act was a racist for, for prevailing wage was, was racist? Um, from what I've read about Davis Bacon, that is far from the truth. So I want that record cleared. It was a fact that these two gentlemen saw a prevailing wage for black employees to come up to standards and not because it was a racist act. Uh, Daniel Hollandrew for the record. Uh, through Chair Flores to Assemblywoman Thomas. Uh, my point wasn't uh, simply that prevailing wage laws as, as they exist today are overtly racist or indirectly racist or otherwise, um, but I am quite confident um, in asserting that the Davis-Bacon Act, and I think this is um, general consensus, um, that it was originally understood to be a racist bill, a bill that sought to exclude minority workers and unions from getting federally funded projects. Um, I've, I've seen, um, I've read and seen tons of evidence to support that. And I'd be happy to, to, to submit uh, follow-up information to you if desired after this committee. Please do, because from what I've read, um, it is not. Um, and I, um... I would um, love to see your data, especially on that topic. Thank you so much. And thank you, Assemblywoman. Um, before I move over to the vice chair, um, I, I did want to put on my on the record kind of a little bit my sentiment and kind of what I'm hearing here. And I, I know I had an opportunity to speak with Assemblyman Ellison. I appreciate uh, engaging in, in meaningful dialogue with you. I think there is a, a, a philosophical argument that is rooted both in data that folk from both sides bring to the table. Um, and you know, it's always been my sentiment that when we, when we pay prevailing wage, um, we typically tend to attract local talent. And how that translates 
it's for me through my perspective is um, I'd rather hire my neighbor to help build a school that their kid and my kid might go to uh, rather than somebody that comes from out of state, works Monday through Thursday, then takes that paycheck um, and spends it elsewhere in a different state, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then repeats that cycle. I, 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 I appreciate the sentiment brought up by MPRI and, and uh, Assemblyman Matthews that it's our money that's paying for that. And I think that's important that we acknowledge that. So I think uh, what we're putting on the pedestal of the question is, if it's our money paying for it, do we wanna pay a wage that ensures we attract local talent? Uh, we have the position and perspective that we build and construct better longer lasting projects. We have folk that are from here that we can look in the eye when something is wrong or we need corrections, that they have to be held accountable should there ever be an issue versus somebody, somebody out of state. The, the truth of the matter, if it's we're, we're using our money, uh, it's our state money, uh, the question is, do we build as cheap as possible or do we build uh, uh, with the emphasis of quality? And I think that's the philosophical debate that's happening here in this committee um, and what is most important. Reasonable minds can disagree, um, but, I, but I thought it was important that we have this conversation and that we recognize what's happening. And I know Assemblyman Ellison has a rural perspective and often has concerns um, of the limitations that the rurals have. And, and, I, and I appreciate uh, his input because I know that he comes from a very centric rural uh, a lens that uh, often some of us in the South don't get a, an opportunity to interact with some members. I appreciate the questions today and everybody engaging in that. I think uh, we're gonna go ahead and close out questions with the exception of vice chair. Uh, I think she had a couple of questions she wanted to do. And then after that, Assemblyman Nelson will go ahead and move on to support. We'll have your folk uh, give, give them an opportunity to speak and support, and then we'll move on to opposition and neutral. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, please. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, Assemblyman Ellison and Mr. Conjurer for the presentation um, and for continuing to engage in this dialogue uh, during today's bill presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just wondering if you could clarify, what is the current federal threshold for prevailing wage? Uh, I don't have that in front of me. I think it's like 60 some dollars, 65 dollars, what it is. Uh, I can get that for you. Uh, that's that's pretty simple. Um, and I I know that uh, it's about 15% uh, higher. Uh, um, it, NPRI, can you answer that question? Uh, I I don't have much to offer here. I'm generally unfamiliar with uh, with federal mandates. Um, I I can certainly look into it going forward. Thank you, and I appreciate that that response. Um, and we have testimony that that could help that from the city, and that could answer some of them questions. Uh, my understanding, though, is that from the Davis Bacon Act, which is a federal. Um, law that the current threshold is two thousand dollars for a project. So that meaning, uh, you know, when we're looking at this legislation, that the public work the estimated cost is less than two thousand. Uh, so that that number is two thousand. Could we just get clarification? I'm not sure um, if maybe our policy analyst or legal can chime in here. Please, Mr. McDonald. Thank you for the record. This is Jared McDonald, and uh, I was just digging around on the internet a little bit, and I believe I thought it was mentioned earlier. I believe the threshold is two thousand dollars for a. Uh, Federal project where a prevailing wage will kick in. Thank you, Mr. Thank McDonald. You. Madam Vice Chair, please. Uh, thank you. I, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I really think, you know, Public Works construction projects have the responsibility to be safe, durable, lasting a long time with minimal maintenance uh, and repairs. And I think the way that we do that is by ensuring that we attract local experienced construction workers who deliver high quality work. Uh, and I really just don't understand why we would have legislation that's raising the prevailing wage to 250,000 uh, when the federal standard is 2,000. So uh, at this time, and I'm not sure if it's appropriate chair, so feel free um, to tell me that it, it, if it's not, but really I would I would like to present a conceptual amendment that would require that we change this threshold and meet the federal standard, which is 2,000. <laughs> um, Madam Vice Chair, so what we can do is uh, to, to, so the record is properly reflected. Uh, Madam Vice Chair will be proposing an amendment now, whether or not uh, the committee wishes to, at a later time, entertain that. Um, that will be up to the, 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 the committee to debate. Um, but so the, the, the property, the procedural way that will move, move forward with this, um, and, and it won't necessarily 
be necessary for us to debate it any further today. Madam Vice Chair will be proposing an amendment to the committee, send it to the uh, committee uh, manager and policy analyst with her amendment. And then at a later time during a work session document, um, it will be up for debate for the members to uh, engage in. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, did you have any follow-up questions? No, no, thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. And thank you for indulging me in the, that amendment. I'll, I'll make sure I take a look at that. And, you know, I, I really just want to echo my appreciation, too, for the Unified Construction Industry Council, who shared a report document that really helped me uh, improve my understanding of prevailing wage and have that uh, and have that as a point of reference. So I really appreciate it. I, I just think that it's important that we um, ensure that we're meeting the federal the federal standard. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, to Madam Torres, uh, there, there are two different issues here. One is a state and one is a federal. Two different projects, two different funding, two different things. So uh, if you look at that, uh, uh, but you're, you'll see that the federal issues for prevailing wage law is Nevada and for uh, the Davis-Bacon Act is federal funding. Thank you. And thank you for that clarification, Assemblyman. And I'll be sure to ensure that uh, but Madam Vice Chair has an opportunity to speak with you, Assembly Mellison, on her proposed amendment of lowering the threshold to 2000. Um, and with that, I'd like to, at this time, invite those wishing to speak in support of Assembly Bill 99. Um, uh, to be abundantly clear, we are speaking in support of Assembly Bill 99 as written by Assemblyman Ellison. The conceptual amendment brought up by Vice Chair Torres will be up for debate should we go to a work session document um, as other members are uh, all allowed to bring up uh, conceptual amendments. Uh, but with that, um, I'd like to go to those wishing to speak in support. It is my understanding that we have some folk who are on on our virtual Zoom that will be joining us via video. I'm just looking through them now. Um, broadcast, am I correct in saying that we don't have anybody wishing to speak in support via Zoom? And just the uh, close, uh, which I know, obviously, we still have our co-presenter, but I'm looking through the video chat now, and I don't believe we have anybody wishing to speak in support that's waiting on video. Is that correct, broadcast? Yes, that is correct, Chair Flores. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to invite those wishing to speak in support of Assembly Bill 99 um, to please call in. I ask that you limit your remarks to two minutes in the interest of time, and as I am concerned, that there may be a, a wide range of folk who are wishing to call. I ask that you please limit your remarks to two minutes. Know that anybody who submits any written document will be sure that it gets uploaded to the record should your time be cut off uh, uh, prematurely. And also, uh, in the interest of time, I ask that uh, we allocate an equal amount of time both to support and opposition. So the way we'll be going about doing that is two minutes per caller, and then we ask that you limit uh, uh, the blocks of support will go to 30 minutes, and then after 30 minutes, we'll go to opposition for 30 minutes, and then we'll do the same thing for neutral. So broadcast, at this time, if we could go to the first caller wishing to speak in support of Assembly Bill 99. To testify in support of Assembly Bill 99, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Mr. Chair, I just got a, uh, a email from uh, or a text from uh, the city of Elko, uh, uh, Andrew Z. He said he's on Zoom. I don't know if you could still pick him up on that or not. Uh, and I'm sorry, uh, and who is that assemblyman? That is uh, uh, County Commissioner uh, Delmo Andrew Z. Broadcast, do we, do we have them on, on Zoom? Hi, this is Cindy with Broadcast. I apologize, Assemblyman Elton. Can you repeat that name for me, please? Pardon? Can you repeat the name of the uh, Delmo Androsi, Ilko County Commissioner? Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I do not have him in our current meeting in our current Zoom, so he will possibly be um, with. Uh, the PC line, the public comment line. Assemblyman Ellison, what we can do so that we can, in the interest of time and allow for, for those wishing to speak in support to be able to do so, 
Um, I will have broadcast uh, message your attache, the proper link for them to be able to join us uh, and support during um, uh, virtually uh, in the next couple of minutes here. So that while those are uh, folk are calling in and support and um, uh, to your bill, um, we'll give them ample time to log in and, and, and join us virtually. So broadcast, Thank if you, I can please message our uh, Assemblyman Ellison's attache and or uh, our community bishop, if you could please uh, message um, Assembl Assemblyman Ellison's attache the proper link so that uh, those wishing to speak in support that wish to join us virtually can do so. And in the meantime, broadcast, if you could please go back to the phone lines and continue with those wishing to call in in support of Assembly Bill 99. Caller with the last three digits of 859, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning. This is Janine Hansen, J-A-N-I-N-E-H-A-N-S-E-N. -E -E I'm the state chairman of the Independent American Party, and I'm pleased to support Assemblyman Ellison's bill. He is my own assemblyman. I live in Elko. We support AB 99, which raises a threshold for paying the prevailing wage for the Nevada system of higher education from 100,000 to 250,000. This will enable our colleges and university to more easily pay for smaller jobs. We also support the amendment, which would apply to rural counties. It is important in all government projects to keep the taxpayers in mind, especially during this economic crisis. This bill is a very reasonable start. In the United States in general, according to the Institute for Policy Innovation, the total U.S. tax burden, including federal, state, and local taxes and hidden taxes, is equal to 56% of annual personal consumption spending. In other words, taxes consume 56% of all the average person spends. This includes 19% in state taxes, 13 in local, and with many hidden taxes the consumer doesn't see. We pay more in taxes than in any other spending category, including food, shelter, education, and healthcare. We must give real consideration to those who cannot bear any more taxes and recognize that there are places we can economize. This bill is a good start. Right now, food prices are soaring faster than inflation and incomes. As the COVID-19 pandemic wreaks havoc on the economic growth, concerns about hunger and malnutrition are rising. We are concerned about the opportunities for rural counties to take care of their local infrastructure. We encourage you to support AB 99, a responsible and reasonable measure, which will benefit taxpayers and rural communities. Thank you very much. And thank you for your testimony, uh, Ms. Hansen. It's always a pleasure to have you. Uh, if we could please go to the next caller wishing to speak in support of Assembly Bill 99. Caller with the last three digits of 863, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. Um, my name is Vincent Guthrow. That's V like Victor, I-N-S-O-N, -S last name Guthrow, G-U-T-H-R-E-A-U. -E I serve as the Deputy Director for the Nevada Association of Counties, NACO, and we are in support of Assembly Bill 99, which raises the threshold on prevailing wage jobs from the current $100,000 to $250,000. We, we believe... Um, this will benefit counties, especially our rural members, if you um, consider the amendment, who are on tighter uh, capital improvement budgets, and it will allow them to complete smaller routine maintenance jobs and put more people to work, improving our parks, libraries, county facilities, and roads. This bill will maximize public tax dollars for projects that improve infrastructure that is utilized by the public. Uh, we thank the sponsor for bringing this bill forward. And we further um, echo the comments that are on Nellis from Commissioner Andriozzi. Um, he outlines what we think provides an excellent perspective and good examples from a rural county. And we thank the committee for hearing this measure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If we could please go to the next caller, which is, excuse me, actually, before we go to the next caller, uh, my understanding is we were finally able to get the commissioner to join us virtually. Is that correct? I'm here. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? 
Yes, we can. Uh, good morning and welcome, whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman Flores and Vice Chairman Torres and distinguished members of the Assembly Government Affairs Committee. My name is Delmo Andreozzi. I am currently a county commissioner in Elko County. I'm serving in my second term, but prior to being elected as a commissioner, I worked for the city of Elko for nearly 31 years. I'm familiar with public works projects, NRS 338 and prevailing wages. As a member of local government, I appreciate the fact that our legislature is considering changing what is considered a public works project and raising the prevailing wage threshold. As a nation, state, and local communities, our public infrastructure continues to age and deteriorate. All of our roads, water, and wastewater systems have design life. They require maintenance and ultimately will require replacement. We work within the confines of our budget to improve the public's infrastructure, despite the fact that it costs more to replace infrastructure than it does installing the new. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it's important to note that prevailing wages essentially increase the cost of a project by a third or alternatively reduces the scope by a third. This threshold is extremely limiting in rural areas of Nevada. Not only has it inflation eroded the value of 100,000 over time, many smaller jurisdictions and cities may only have a capital projects budget of two or 300,000 or maybe even 500,000. I heard Mr. Ellison or Assemblyman Ellison talk about the city of Elko as an example, the city of Elko capital budget for their public works department is annually $750,000. They usually have to save for two years to do a capital project. Elko County's at $1.5 million. So our, our, our large, even our large projects are really quite small in comparison to the urban areas of the state. Um, and when we think about doing these smaller projects, the cost of mobilizing equipment and manpower to do projects multiple times increases the cost of the project cutting into these already thin budgets. Economies of scale are not as likely to happen in rural areas as they are in the urban area. As an example, many, many of our communities don't even have the basic supplies or have access to local asphalt or concrete batch facilities. These items must be shipped, which further erodes the available budget. For context, a typical street project here in Elko, Nevada costs approximately $100,000 per block, which is roughly 350 lineal feet. This would be a basic replacement of curb gutter, sidewalk, and asphalt. Any subgrade work required would likely result in each block being in excess of $100,000. So it's not practical to do less than a, um, than a block. And one other thing that I would like to point out as I did listen to some of the testimony, maybe can provide some additional context uh, or background. I would just like to also remind that all, all projects in the public's right of way are required to be done by a licensed contractor, whether it's a prevailing way project or not. So in our case here in Elko County, we have, as Assemblyman Ellison stated, we have uh, many of the trades here, but some of, some of the ones we don't. We actually, the larger buildings like a school project or something like that, most often those contractors come from uh, the Salt Lake area to, to this uh, rural area. So again, I am su in support of this um, and I, uh, I appreciate the Labor Commission being on there. I think it's valuable to have some information to really look at what the projects were between one hundred and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars I think there could be some good evidence and a compelling story to assist this body in making a well-informed decision and again I want to thank you for your time and willingness to consider alternatives that leverage the public's resources better serving our citizens to improve our infrastructure thank you and that thank concludes you. the presentation Mr. Chairman and thank you Commissioner uh, members, I, I want to, just for the sake of transparency, explain why I allowed the commissioner to uh, go beyond the two minutes and really was closer to four. Um, the, it was originally the intent of Assemblyman Ellison to have the commissioner co-present and uh, have him available for discussion, questions, et cetera. And so in the interest of fairness, and I know we had some technical issues getting him logged in, uh, I wanted to ensure that we gave him the full breadth of his testimony uh, that is the reason why I did that, but however, I do want to remind uh, those wishing to call in support, opposition or neutral, that you do re uh, refrain from exceeding two minutes and that you can always submit your testimony in writing and I'll be sure that it gets uploaded to an Ellis uh, broadcast. And again, uh, Mr. Commissioner, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, broadcast, if we could please go to the next caller wishing to speak in support of Assembly Bill 99. 
to testify in support of Assembly Bill 99. Please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller, with the last three digits of 718, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair Flores, Vice Chair Torres, for allowing my statement of support. My name is Wesley Harper, W-E-S-L-E-Y-H-A-R-P-E-R. -E -E I am the Executive Director of the Nevada League of Cities and Municipalities. The League is in support of AB 99, and we appreciate the work of the sponsor to bring this bill forward and the distinguished members of the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs for hearing it. This bill is a practical and limited adjustment to the prevailing wage requirement that would enable rural communities to move forward with essential construction of Nevada system of higher education infrastructure. Again, thank you, Mr. Chair and Madam Vice Chair, for allowing my statement of support. Thank you for your testimony this morning. Next, I'd like to go to the next caller wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 99. Caller, with the last three digits of 666, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, this is Warren Hardy, first name W-A-R-R-E-N, last name Hardy, H-A-R-D-Y, calling today on behalf of the City of Mesquite and the Associated Bills and Contractors of Nevada. <clears throat> I first want to thank the Chair for uh, the very fair and equitable manner in which he's allowed this hearing to proceed today. Um, this has been an issue that we've discussed in the legislature for many, many years, and both the City of Mesquite and the Associated Builders and Contractors is in support of increasing the threshold to 250000 from 100000 That $100,000 number was sort of randomly selected many, many, many years ago. There's not been an increase in the minimum wage threshold. Uh, it was a very interesting dialogue that occurred during the hearing um, about the merits of prevailing wage. Uh, but again, this this legislation simply proposes to increase the threshold, which is probably uh, overdue. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the time, and, and thank you for taking the time to, to uh, fairly and equitably um, have this hearing today. And good morning to you, Mr. Hardy. It's always great to hear from you. Thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, at this time, I'd like to continue to invite those wishing to speak in support of Assembly Bill 99. We can go to the next caller broadcast. Caller with the last three digits of 269. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 269. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Leo Blundo, B-L-U-N-D-O, my County Commissioner from District 4. I'm also the Regional Transportation Commission Chairman for Nye County, speaking in behalf of my individually elected uh, office. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman uh, Flores for, for allowing me the opportunity to testify on this and uh, the Assembly Committee members, I uh, appreciate your time today. Um, I just want to present a real simple equation for you. If I have 300000 in my budget and I have the option of doing $250,000 projects, would you prefer me to have two projects move forward or would you like me to say I'll only do the one because of the $100,000 threshold? Um, I have to make decisions um, weekly, monthly, on which projects we move, we decide to choose to move forward on. We currently have an RTC budget of $2.2 million um, approximately, and I have to make decisions on which projects move forward. Um, we have to gauge, um, is it through that threshold? Can I execute another project? And given the fact that I have 2,200 miles of actual roads in Nye County, it's a very daunting task to choose 
winners and losers and which roads I can do. Um, I think increasing this threshold will allow us the opportunity to create more projects to be able to move forward for. But we're not just talking about roads here. It's also doing sidewalk projects and other public works projects that, that, that reside in other budgets as well. Again, I have to ask you to weigh the fact that would you consider, would you allow me the opportunity to have and, and, and finance and put forward another project that continues to pay uh, wages to, to Nevadans and to continue to keep good people working, especially in these dire economic times where people are struggling just to have work and keep their jobs going? Or would you prefer me to, um, to not approve projects because the funding just isn't there? Now, it's easy to say we should be raising taxes or looking at other revenue sources. However, I have to make the fiscally responsible decisions and balance and, and, and execute through a balanced budget. Um, one of the reasons I think you don't see uh, this drastic drop of projects is because we just don't put in the projects. I, I don't make the irresponsible decision to say I'm going to start four projects, fund them all halfway, and then leave the taxpayers and say, hey, I'm going to raise taxes on you or these projects never get done. And we have a constant limbo of projects sitting there. So we have to make the, the, at most, the most educated decisions and we have to continue to approve projects that I can afford to do. But the little projects and raising a threshold uh, to 250000 I think, is a fiscally responsible way of saying we have issues across the rules and the rules are Nevadans as well. And we're going to allow them the same opportunities afforded to the bigger cities to be able to execute the same projects and be able to continue to approve and Commissioner, we, we've exceeded two minutes. If you could please just wrap it up. Thank, uh, you, any closing remarks? Thank you, sir. Uh, if we could please go to the next caller, we should testify in support of Assembly Bill 99. Caller with the last three digits of 124. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Flores. Paul Moratkin, M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N, with the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber is in support of Assembly Bill 99, as it would provide greater flexibility for smaller projects and a good use of taxpayer dollars. Thank you for your time this morning. And thank you for your testimony. If we could go to the next caller wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 99. Caller, with the last three digits of 323, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chairman Flores. Thanks for letting me speak. My name is Steve Walker, S-T-E-B-E-W-A-L-K-E-R. I represent Douglas, Story, Carson City, and Lyon counties. We are in support of the uh, amended bill, the Chairman uh, Assembly and Ellison's amendment. Uh, and for the sake of time, I, we, uh, I will not go in any further, uh, but I would echo the statements made by the League of Cities and NAPM. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this morning. And And just following up on that particular testimony and support, I, I know it's important for us to be heard and I want you to know that you, you are being heard, but, uh, but I do wanna remind you that it's perfectly okay to say that you echo the sentiment that's been stated already on the record uh, to make sure that your name gets placed on it and, and we can move on to the next caller. So we appreciate that always in this committee. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to continue with the support for Assembly Bill 99. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 907. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. This is Mike Katsonis, M-I-K-E-K-A-T-S-O-N-I-S. I live in Wendover, West Wendover, Nevada. And I'd just like to thank you for allowing me to uh, testify this morning. And I echo the comments in support of AB 99 and as amended by Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you. 
And thank you, Mr. Katzan. It's, it's always an honor to have uh, members, just general members of the community call in. Uh, know that you can always do that and you have a place to speak here. Thank you for calling in this morning. If we could go to the next caller wishing to speak in support of Assembly Bill 99. Caller, with the last three digits of 126, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning. This is Kelly Woldridge, K-E-L-L-Y-W-O-O-L-D-R-I-D-G-E -E, with the City of Elko. The City of Elko is in support of this bill and the conceptual amendment. In an answer to Assemblywoman Considine's question, the City of Elko has had an average of 3.6 projects that would fall between the 100,000 and 400,000, or excuse me, 250,000 thresh threshold. The other issue that we would have liked to have seen addressed in this is the Apprenticeship Act. Um, it has been very difficult with COVID for the City of Elko to meet the Apprenticeship Act, and we had a contractor that was four hours um, low on getting an apprentice and was fined $9,000. During COVID, it's been difficult to get apprentices to the rural area, and once they get here, they don't often stay throughout the job. Since COVID, we've also seen an increase in the cost and availability of materials, increasing our construction costs on bids. Thank you for hearing this bill today, and thank you for your time. And thank you for joining us this morning. If we could go to the next caller wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 99. Caller, with the last three digits of 924, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, my name is Alida Benson, A-L-I-D-A-B-E-N-S-O-N. I'm calling in to say a big thank you to Assemblyman Ellison for sponsoring this bill. I encourage all members to vote yes on AB 99 and vote for savings for the Nevada taxpayer. Our agencies should have the freedom to negotiate the best rate possible to get the job done and also be incentivized to save as much taxpayer money as possible. This is a no-brainer. We have a budget crunch. This saves Nevada taxpayers money while still assuring we have quality without the added 60% markup that is a hallmark of prevailing wage laws. Please vote yes on AB 99. I would also like to note that it is inappropriate that several members of this committee who are currently under litigation for violating the Nevada Constitution have not recused themselves from this hearing. Those are Selena Torres, Nathan Anderson, and Clara Thomas, all of whom have concurrent employment with the yeah. state in violation um, of Article 3, audio, please, Section 1 of Nevada State Constitution. All right. So this is how we're going to move forward. Um, I, everybody is welcome to speak. On, on a matter that they think is important today. And presently we're addressing Assembly Bill 99. So if you wanna express your support for that bill, that is where we are now. You can get on the record, state your name for the record, um, ensure that you are being heard in support of a bill. But this is not a time, nor will ever be appropriate in this committee for you to ever personally attack or single out any single member. We may disagree on policy, but we are not disagreeing on the, on the the obvious reality that we're all in this situation trying to improve the lives of all Nevadans. So it is inappropriate, always wrong, and it will not be tolerated for anyone to do any personal attacks. We can disagree on policy, we can attack policy, uh, but we will remain respectful of each other at all times. Uh, if any other caller wishes to continue to engage in any type of dialogue, we will shut you off. This is not a time to do that. It is wholly inappropriate to do that. Um, and I, I know Assemblyman Ellison, I know that you don't have control who's calling in support. Uh, so don't, I don't want you to feel that I am putting this on you, but I wanna make the record abundantly clear that we will not tolerate that ever. No personal attacks, attack the policy if you wish. That's perfectly fine. Um, with that, if we could go to the next caller wishing to speak in support of Assembly Bill 99. Caller, oh, with the last three digits of 283, Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes. Marcos. You may begin. Marcos Lopez, M-A-R-C-O-S, L-O-P-U-Z, Americans for Prosperity Nevada. Thank you, Chair and members of the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. Uh, we are in support of AB 99. It is a small but positive change that will help rural counties and cities uh, with their public works by allowing them to use taxpayer dollars more efficiently and effectively um, at a time when our budgets are squeezed, we should be looking at ways to use our money more efficiently. 
We shouldn't be paying upwards of 40 percent for public work. The state needs to act like it has a fiduciary interest over taxpayers' money. The research is clear. Prevailing wages needlessly raises the cost of constructed projects by billions of dollars annually around the nation. We are literally throwing money away. Um, I will submit some prepared statements, but I do want to address some of the comments that were made during the hearing. No, nothing in this bill is saying if you're interested in, you know, stimulating the economy that you can't spend the same amount of the budget on projects. What we're saying is that you can use that money to build more projects. So you can have more workers. The savings, for example, on building classrooms, you can use it to build new schools. You can use it to redirect it into the classrooms, into teacher pay. There's all sorts of different things that you can do that this bill does not <clears throat> mandate in terms of what you do with the savings. Uh, so you can still get the same amount of money out. Um, secondly, um, I think it's a false dichotomy to say that you're choosing between quality and quantity here uh, in the work. There are 23 states that do not use prevailing wages, and there's little to no evidence that says that the construction of those 23 states is any less good or any less um, uh, properly built than in the other states that use prevailing wages. Um, and lastly, as to the conceptual amendment of lowering this to 2000, uh, I mean, if you want to blow up the budget, if you want to just completely just disregard judiciary interest of taxpayer money, I think that you should totally go out that for that. I would love to be able to say that this state has completely forgotten about the taxpayer and using money efficiently and effectively, um, and would love to see what that would do to the budget. It, it, it is, um, it is almost laughable that we complain about not having revenue, then just waste our money in the most inefficient ways possible. Uh, but I urge you guys to support AB 99. It is, is a small but positive change. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lopez, for your comments. I know we often don't have an opportunity to engage in meaningful debate in this committee with you and or um, and to work together. So it's always great to have you here. Um, if we could please uh, continue with those wishing to speak in opposition to Assembly Bill 99. Caller, with the last three digits of 880, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning. This is Darren Schultz, Public Works Director for Carson City. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I am calling in support of this bill and amendment. I apologize. Spelling of my name is Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N. Last name, Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-Z. Public Works Director here in Carson. Uh, we are in support of the bill and the amendment, um, as has been stated, and uh, I'll, I'll refrain from comments and uh, just take those that have been said. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we could go to the next caller wishing to speak in support of Assembly Bill 99. Caller, with the last three digits of 105, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Uh, Chairman Flores and committee, my name is Lynn Chapman, State Vice President of Nevada Families for Freedom, L-Y-N-N-C-H-A-P-M-A-N. -N -N. We, the taxpayers, are very concerned with the cost of construction projects. Most people don't know about prevailing wages and they don't understand it, they've never heard of it, um, but what is it for? Well, it's to build projects in our communities. However, who pays for all of the projects? Why? The taxpayers, whether it be federal, state, county, or our city, all that money comes from the taxpayers. It would be great if we could slightly reduce the burden to the taxpayers, um, and it would be very helpful to our uh, families in rural Nevada. Uh, why would our state want to tie the hands of rural Nevadas in getting the projects done? Savings should be in the mix as well for the taxpayers. Um, also, uh, we uh, are worried about um, the workers in the smaller rural areas, uh, the smaller projects, 
the workers are there in the communities. They would be put to work, uh, and they would take their money home with them in the communities where the work is done, uh, and it would support their communities. So we need to support AB 99. We should support rural Nevadan families. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we'll continue with support for Assembly Bill 99 broadcast. For the new callers to testify in support of Assembly Bill 99, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. And uh, thank you. Uh, and I wanna thank all those of you who called in in support of Assembly Bill 99. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite those wishing to speak in, op in opposition to Assembly Bill 99. I want to remind those of you who intend to be calling in uh, that you should always feel comfortable to say a quick ditto, primarily from those of you that are members of our lobbying community. We love you, uh, but we want, really want to leave the platform open for a lot of members of the community who don't have an opportunity to engage in this type of setting off. And, um, and a quick ditto from our lobbying community. We appreciate you uh, even more when you do that. So. Uh, but with that, I, I do ask that you, you try to limit your remarks to two minutes. Uh, we try to be flexible when we can. I know that we do have joining us uh, Mr. Bill Stanley, uh, who's joining us virtually, wishing to speak in support, I mean, excuse me, opposition to Assembly Bill 99. So we'll start with the video and then we'll move on to those wishing to speak in opposition via phone. Uh, Mr. Stanley, good morning. Welcome. Whenever you're ready. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Torres. Um, um, where to start? <laughs> We've heard a lot of testimony this morning and uh, I have been around here for a long time and I will take your advice, Mr. Flores. I will submit my otherwise prepared uh, statement and try to address a couple of the issues that were raised here today that uh, I believe uh, absolutely need to be addressed. Uh, foremost, uh, I think it is absolutely insulting that anyone would come before this committee and, and offer up testimony that prevailing wage, whether it be Davis-Bacon or the state's prevailing wage statute in and of itself was ever or is intended to be discriminatory. That is absolutely insulting. Let's be clear. There were two, there was two uh, uh, folks in Congress, uh, Senator Bacon and Senator, uh, I think I got this right, uh, Davis, who introduced a bill in New York City uh, that was um, in, intended to prevent uh, workers coming in from outside the state to do what was otherwise public work being paid for by the citizens and the taxpayers in New York. There was a contractor who was wanting to exploit and import workers from the South uh, to do that work at a far cheaper rate. And that story has been through history, uh, has been uh, turned uh, on its head. Uh, that has been interpreted to be, was to be discriminatory against the workforce that was being imported from the South. I have taught labor history for 30 years. Uh, that, uh, that conversation and, and that uh, history is well documented, has no place in these conversations. So let me move beyond that. Um, the premise of, of, of those that are arguing here today is very basic. The premise is that if we pay construction workers less money, we can do more projects. And it's somehow a waste of money if we pay construction workers a livable wage, a wage rate that allows them to live the middle class uh, a dream in this country and send their kids to school and provide them with opportunities uh, to participate in, in extracurricular activities, that somehow, uh, if we could just leverage these construction workers and pay them less money, we could do more projects. Well, I can tell you, ask the construction worker in rural Nevada if he's or she's willing to work for less money so that you can do more projects. And next, I'd just like to talk about, in 2019, Senator Hardy and the building trades uh, with one of your previous speakers, Warren Hardy, worked diligently to construct a bill that allows rural Nevada to establish a prevailing wage rate that is not the same as rural Nevada. There are four prevailing wage zones in Nevada that were constructed through that uh, legislation. Washoe County, Clark County being the two metro areas, 
and the rest of the county, uh, the southern uh, rural is made up of Lincoln, Nye, Esmeralda uh, counties, and the rest of the state is in the northern rural. And the wage rates that are determined for the prevailing wage in rural Nevada are wages that are earned in rural Nevada. So this concept that somehow the wage rates in rural Nevada are not responsive or reflective of the wages raised or earned in rural Nevada is just not true. Uh, next, I'd just like to talk about unbundling of projects. When we talk about bundling, there was some conversation about bundling of projects. Let's talk about unbundling of projects. What we really see happening is awarding agencies in the state of Nevada figure out a way to unbundle projects so that they can escape the, way, the, the prevailing wage rate and exploit construction workers and pay them less than is surveyed in the area in order to, in their minds, complete the project for less money. Well, unbundling of projects is a problem. We fight it all the time. The labor commissioner gets more complaints over, probably over unbundling of projects from awarding body than probably any other uh, uh, complaints that she gets uh, on the prevailing wage side. So lowering the threshold to $2,000, and I appreciate the conceptual amendment uh, from the vice chair. I'm in favor of lowering it to $2,000, which, which is the federal rate, making and aligning the state's prevailing wage with Davis-Bacon, which is the federal prevailing wage rate, has been a concept that the building trades has been pushing for a very long time. In fact, that was the premise behind us supporting Warren Hardy's bill in 2019, which was the rules. Mr. Stanley, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Wrap. I, I apologize to, to uh, interrupt you. There's two two questions um, on there, and we 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 have exceeded the two minutes. I, I just wanted to put you on notice of that, um, but we'll make sure that your comments are shared. But we have two questions. One is uh, a point of clarification from Assemblywoman Dickman. If you could please restate who are you with and representing now. And the second question is, uh, would you support Assembly Bill 99 with the conceptual amendment uh, mentioned by Vice Chair Torres. So I'm sorry for the record. My name is William Stanley. I represent the Southern Nevada Building Trades Union uh, in Southern Nevada with with, um, uh, with over 20,000 uh, construction, we represent over 20,000 construction workers throughout Southern Nevada, including uh, the rural uh, counties that I mentioned as part of the rural zone, uh, Southern rural zone. Uh, and I, um, uh, I'm not in favor of this bill. I'm not in favor of the bill with uh, Senator, I mean, with Assemblyman Ellison's conceptual amendment, but I would support the bill uh, with the conceptual amendment uh, that was put forth by uh, Assemblywoman Torres. Okay, and Mr. Stanley, if I could have you go ahead and uh, any closing remarks you may have. I will, um, I appreciate the time. I will um, augment my um, comments here. Uh, there was so much raised here today that uh, and I would just wrap up by saying this. Uh, the 2019 study that we presented uh, to this committee when this bill was heard in 2019, similar uh, bill was heard in 2019 with the same arguments, completely refutes all of these arguments, especially the NPI argument and the, and the study that they had brought forth and, and going back uh, many, many sessions. Uh, that report was completely refuted in 2019. And I would hope that you would look at the um, uh, the study that was uploaded by my colleague from the Unified Construction Industry Council, Ms. Wendy uh, Newman, and she will testify next. So thank you, uh, Chairman Flores and, and Vice Chair and members of the committee uh, for allowing me this time to testify. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Stanley. And I encourage all members to reach out, whether you are in support or opposition to the bill as written by Assemblyman Ellison, so that you can continue this dialogue offline. Um, I, I know he has a wealth of in of uh, information that he would gladly discuss with you. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and go to the phone lines and invite those wishing to speak in support, excuse me, opposition to Assembly Bill 99. Again, I'd ask that you please try to limit your remarks to two minutes. We'll throw some flexibility in there where we can, uh, but please uh, broadcast. To testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 99, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller, with the last three digits of 219, please slowly state and spell your name for the record.
You will have two minutes and may begin. Wendy oh. Newman with Excuse me, Wendy Newman, W E N D I N E W M A N with Unified Construction Industry Council for the record. Good morning, Chairman Flores, Madam Vice Chair Torres, and members of the committee. I'm Wendy Newman with the, the Executive Director of Unified Construction Industry Council, hereafter known as UCIC. The UCIC is a labor management cooperative committee composed of 14 affiliated skilled craft trades unions and over 200 contractors who employ the over 20,000 skilled trade workers. In Nellis, we have submitted the 2019 study on the impact of Nevada's 90% prevailing wage policy on school construction costs, big competition, and apprenticeship training. Contrary to what the proponents may have said, increasing the threshold for prevailing wage projects does not save taxpayers' money. The unintended consequences of the policy that was put into effect with the previous passage of AB 172 in 2015 reduced participation of union signatory contractors in bidding on school district projects. This change contributed to an across the board decrease in bid competition, an increase in bid cost, and a reduction in apprenticeship training resources and opportunity. The negative effect on training reduces opportunities for construction workers in Nevada to increase their skills and earnings. Because skilled workers in construction or in any other industry are our state's assets, a reduction in training opportunities and resourcing is harmful to Nevada's economy. The UCIC is in opposition of AB 99 as written and supports the amendment that would lower the threshold to that of the Federal Davis-Bacon Act of $2,000. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this morning. Always a pleasure. If we could please go to the next caller wishing to speak in opposition to Assembly Bill 99. Caller, with the last three digits of 764, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Mike West, M-I-K-E-W-E-S-T. -E I represent the women and men of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. We stand with the Nevada Building Trades in opposition of AB 99 and raising the threshold of prevailing wage from $100,000 to $250,000. Many projects would then be disqualified if, if the amount more than doubles, especially if these small projects may only consist of new paint and floor covering. May I suggest that if you did a forensic audit of a public works project and get the entities to open their books, that you may find that many take profit out of a project before it even hits the construction phase. If you compare the delta between prevailing wage and the market rate that it is potentially much smaller compared to the windfall of profit that is taken out early in the project yet we still keep trying to balance the budget of a public works project off the backs of the workers it's for these reasons that we stand with the building trades in opposition of the bill in print thank you and thank you if we could go to the next caller wishing to speak in opposition of Assembly Bill 99. Caller, with the last three digits of 352, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chairman Flores and committee. My name is Frank Hawk. I'm with the Southwest Carpenters Union, uh, F-R-A-N-K, H-A-W-K. Ironically, Republicans author it and champion the Davis-Bacon Act nearly 100 years ago. And contrary to the testimony today, it wasn't racist. Uh, that's insulting. Yet in Nevada, every session, there's an attack on working people by coming after prevailing wage. 
don't be fooled. This is just another attack on Nevada working people by chipping away at wages and benefits. Somehow these elected officials feel that Nevada hardworking men and women that, uh, you know, they become experts in their trade by going to four years of formal training. They set their alarm clocks for 3 a.m. They work in the elements and risk their lives every single day to build America's infrastructure are somehow worth less than a living wage. Don't be fooled by these fictitious scenarios, flawed data, or the false argument of rural versus uh, urban. Think about it. Uh, Faraway areas that need people to come to rural areas. There's no motels. There's no restaurants. It's not going to attract skilled workers to come up and work for less money. It's just not going to happen. The last time the legislature took a swipe at prevailing wage, it cost my carpenter $600 a month. What happened? The skilled carpenter went to work in private jobs instead of building our children's schools. Uh, they, they were replaced with out-of-state workers, an uh, out-of-state workforce and that was unregulated, it bred immigrant abuse, and it, it was undercutting our Nevada residents. On behalf of our 9,000 carpenters here that make up local 1977 and 971 and the apprentices and their families, I urge you to vote no on this bill as presented, unless, of course, that I would be in support of Vice Chair Torres' amendment. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak here today. And thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, if we could please go to the next caller wishing to speak in opposition to Assembly Bill 99. Caller with the last three digits of 018, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, committee. My name is Jim Sullivan, J-I-M-S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N and I'm representing the Culinary Workers Union Local 226. We are opposed to this bill for the reasons that Bill Stanley, Wendy Newman, and uh, several other callers have expressed. Um, this, bill is bad. this bill as written is bad for working Nevadans and we fully oppose. Thank you. And Mr. Sullivan, it's not often that we, we can have you in our committee, so it's great to have you join us this morning. Thank you. Uh, if we could please go to the next caller wishing to speak in opposition to Assembly Bill 99. Caller with the last three digits of 534, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, this is uh, Richard Daly, R-I-C-H-A-R-D-D-A-L-Y. You can call me Skip, uh, representing the Labor's Union Local 169 here in Northern Nevada. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, where to begin? Uh, as Mr. Stanley said, uh, a lot of either intentionally or unintentionally untruths uh, were stated here today. Uh, prevailing wage is not racist. It was uh, started uh, by two Republican senators from New York, Davis and Bacon, uh, to level the playing field for local workers in the local economy to make sure that uh, the local workforce and contractors and employers were not undercut. Bottom line is this bill is going to uh, lower wages for workers in these rural communities, uh, which is the testimony we have. If you take the uh, example given by uh, Assemblyman Ellison, if we have $150,000 uh, or we only have we have a $150,000 project, we only have $100,000, that somehow this measure by lowering the wages of workers would save you the $50,000. And that is just untrue. The other statement made by the gentleman from Elko that prevailing wage costs uh, makes construction costs go up a third. We presented uh, the bill and trades has presented studies to this committee in the past that shows depending on the type of construction, road construction versus building, the amount of cost for labor for the project is as low as 16% and at the high end, 30%. So of the total cost of the project, only 30% is labor. So in order to save a third, the workers would have to pay the contractor to do the job to save that much money. So that is an untruth, it's untrue. Uh, I'll stop short of saying the other word that I really wanna say. Uh, so I oppose this bill. Uh, it does cost uh, construction workers uh, when we had the last changes on the school construction and all of those things. 
uh, it's it's wrong uh, thinking. And to make a recent quote from the uh, President Biden, uh, in my opinion, this is uh, Neanderthal thinking. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Mr. Daly. It's great to have you back here at the uh, in your GA committee. Um, you're always welcome home here. Um, with that, I'd like to continue with those wishing to speak in opposition to Assembly Bill 99. Caller, with the last three digits of 292, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chairman Flores. Uh, Rob Benner, R-O-B-B-E-N-N-E-R, -E -E uh, with the Northern Nevada Building Trades. We strongly oppose AB 99 as written, but we do support Vice Chair Torres' amendment, putting Nevada's prevailing wage threshold in alignment with the federal level. Last time we raised the threshold, it reduced apprenticeship opportunities, reduced wages, and reduced jobs, jobs for Nevadans. As written, this bill would put Utah workers to work, not Nevadans. Assembly Bill 99 would hurt Nevada's hardest working men and women, at a time when they can least afford it. We should be working to lower the threshold to protect Nevada's contractors, Nevada's businesses, Nevada's workers, and keep our tax dollars here. Nevada's recovery depends on it. Now is the time to stand up and protect Nevada's men and working men and women. Thank you. And thank you. Um, I'd like to continue with those wishing to speak in opposition to Assembly Bill 99. Broadcast, please. Testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 99. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller, with the last three digits of 056, Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Chairman Flores and committee members, my name is James Halsey and I represent the 4,000 members of IBW Local 357. Uh, we're the ones that keep the lights on in Las Vegas. Two years ago at this same committee, a study was presented that said a strong prevailing wage provided value to our community. That, bi that bill, the strength in prevailing wage was presented by the Speaker of the House and when it became law, it helped ensure that our public dollars are spent on the most qualified workforce available. Over the past two years, more contractors and local workers have been able to compete in the now level playing field. This increase in competition is good for our public works dollar and good for the community. I see no reason to turn our backs on the same workforce that has continued to build our schools, roads, and public buildings during the worst pandemic in over 100 years. Early on in this pandemic, construction was deemed an essential workforce. This bill, AB 99, says we are not. On behalf of IBW Local 357, we are opposed to this bill. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your testimony this morning. If we could continue with opposition to Assembly Bill 99. Caller, with the last three digits of 429, Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller, with the last three digits of 429, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. And again, I want to thank all those of you who participated this morning uh, speaking in opposition to Assembly Bill 99. And now I would like to invite those wishing to speak in the neutral position to Assembly Bill 99. Broadcast, please. To testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 99, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time.
Thank you. We'll go ahead and close out mutual and we'll come back to Assemblyman Ellison. Any closing remarks you may have? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I do. Uh, number one, uh, I'd like to know of the contractors that spoke, how many of them's done any jobs for $100,000 in rural Nevada? And I can tell you there's going to be none. If they were, it had been small projects right close to Washoe or one of these. Uh, that's my number one comment. Number two, the Davis-Bacon Act. I guarantee it. Open it up and see what happens. Because I guarantee it. California, Idaho, and Utah will swarm this state. Uh, so it, it's crazy and ludicrous. So I'm just telling you, you want to throw rural Nevada under the bus? Have at it. But I tell you what, the people are hardworking, loving people of this state and care about this state. They didn't ask for anything. They just asked for it to be the threshold raised where they can do some project. But them people that are out of work will stay out of work. So, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I apologize for getting upset, but I'm disappointed with the comments. But I guarantee it. The union guys from Las Vegas had never been to rural Nevada unless it's a big project like a school or a big commercial project. None. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize for my upsetness. But I tell you, it's ludicrous and it's crazy. So thank you. And thank you, Assemblyman, for your presentation today. I think reasonable humans will often disagree on policy. And as long as we maintain the conversation and debate there, um, it's fair game in this committee. Um, again, members, uh, we often agree and I just make that point because just because we're having a philosophical debate now, disagreement on this particular issue does not mean that we cannot continue to work together on other stuff. So I, I, I implore that we continue to have an open dialogue and that uh, we take today's debate as an opportunity to understand that sometimes we can disagree, get up together and continue to work for all Nevadans as we've been doing and as we've been summoned to do here in this building. So I'm going to go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 99. Again, I, I appreciate all those of you that came in support, opposition, and neutral to have your voices heard. Uh, members, tomorrow, uh, well, actually, before I, I do this, um, I would like to open it up for public comment and invite those wishing to speak in public comment to please join us. I want to remind everyone who is wishing to speak in public comment, this is not an opportunity to re-engage in a debate for Assembly Bill 99. That hearing has now been closed. Uh, public comment is an opportunity for you to speak about uh, broad matters that pertain to and, are, and fall within the purview of this uh, committee. Um, we want you to be heard, um, but if you're disrespectful and or are trying to reopen a debate on Assembly Bill 99, um, I will ask that uh, we go to the next caller. So broadcast, if we could please go to those wishing to speak in public comment. To take place in public comment, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Understood, thank you, broadcast. At this time, we'll go ahead and close out public comment. And uh, members, I want to remind you that tomorrow we're going to be doing a work session document. I, I hope you have an opportunity to review that ahead of time. Uh, up for work session discussion is Assembly Bill 14, Assembly Bill 22, Assembly Bill 48, Assembly Bill 63, Assembly Bill 70, Assembly Bill 77, and Assembly Bill 86. Uh, please give yourself an opportunity to review your notes on all of those bills. Uh, make sure that uh, if you have any opposition and or concerns, that you please notify myself and or the bill sponsors um, so that we have a heads up as to where you stand in your position on that particular uh, vote. Uh, again, I wanna uh, say thank you to everybody for engaging in meaningful dialogue today. I look forward to continuing this conversation. This meeting's adjourned.